This is chapter 10. This is section 10-1. This is recording number two. All right, so we're going to talk about the significance of the correlation coefficient. And what he means by that is the statistical significance. Is it a statistically significant value? Is kind of the idea here. And as he mentions right here, the the correlation coefficient is always going to be, by definition, is going to be between negative 1 and positive 1. If it's near positive 1 or near negative 1, there is a strong linear relationship, okay? If it's exactly 1, then it's, a, it's an exact uh, relationship. It would look something like this. It would be a, a straight line. So this would be a positive... This would be r is equal to 1. This is r equals negative 1. So the r here, if you remember back from some of your, hopefully you took some classes here, Math 35, where we talk about this, uh, this is the slope of the line, a positive slope. It goes uphill, so to speak. Negative slope, it goes downhill. So if, it's a, if r is equal to 1, it looks kind of like this. If it's a 0 0.90, well, that's a positive number, but it's not really that close to 1. Well, it's close, but it's not it's not one. So that's why you can still see a band here. It's not a uh, it's not a straight line. Okay. Okay. So as he says, uh, you know, you get the data from the samples. There's always two possibilities. If it's not exactly equal to one, not exactly equal to negative one. Okay. Uh, it, it the is the value of R is it high enough to conclude that there is a significant linear relationship? between the variables uh, or is it just kind of random chance I mean just these things just happen in in life okay so it's the same process as before you state the various the two hypotheses find the critical values compute the test value make a decision and then summarize the results okay so I'm gonna let you read this on your own okay the only nuance here is that the the null hypothesis is always going to be the same thing it's always going to be that the correlation coefficient, the so-called, this is, this letter here, he mentions it, of course, in the book. I don't think I mentioned it before. That's called a row, R-H-O, a row. That's the symbol we use for the uh, correlation coefficient. Okay, so a, a typical scenario, uh, you know, you get a bunch of data, you, you look at the data and you say, gosh, it looks like there's some sort of a correlation to me, but you really can't answer it by your intuition. You really have to do these, these calculations. So the null hypothesis is that rho is equal to zero. There is no correlation. It's just totally random. Random, uh, there's no connection between them, no correlation. There's no linkage. Rho not equal to zero, that's your alternative hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis means there is a significant correlation between the variables in the population. So it's, it's like we've done before in other contexts with hypothesis testing. You know, you, you want to you have a significant, a statistically significant situation, and it's not just due to chance. And it all, what it boils down to is, when you, if you reject the null hypothesis, you recognize, hey, I may, I may be making a mistake by rejecting the null hypothesis. However, I'm only going to be wrong alpha amount of the time. Say five percent of the time, I'm going to be wrong. That's my, that's my alpha. So that's a, it's a, a five percent level of confidence. Sometimes people will say it's a ninety-five percent level of confidence, but your alpha is, is some number. Uh, 5%, 2%, whatever it happens to be. Okay, so he certainly sums it up very nicely here. If you reject the null hypothesis at some specified level, in other words, at alpha 5%, it means that there is a significant difference between the value of R and 0. Now, R can be positive or negative. So is there a significant difference between R and 0? If, uh, if you reject the null hypothesis, you're saying, yeah, there is. There is a significant difference. If the null hypothesis is not rejected, it means that the value of R is not significantly different from zero, and it is probably due to chance. Any correlation is due to chance. Now, the reason this is, you know, look at it this way is because just by random chance, you could have a slightly positive R or a slightly uh, positive, 
slightly positive R, slightly negative R, but it's still going to be, um, you know, just do the chance. And I guess I need to revise my previous comment. Uh, the, the, here, here's the definition of rho. It's the population correlation coefficient. It's, it's computed by using all possible pairs of data values and taken from a population. I, I don't see us using that at all. This is the this is R, the correlation coefficient, and then that it measures the strength and the direction. Is it a is it a really strong correlation, and is it a positive or is it a negative? So that's what we're going to be actually looking at is a correlation coefficient. Okay. Okay, so in order to do this, we have to make certain assumptions. You also could refer to these as being requirements. These are the requirements or the assumptions that you are making. Uh, first of all, the, the data it w would be quantitative. It's not like, uh, you know, you don't say, you can't make a correlation if you're talking about uh, non quantitative information like for example if you said gee uh all these you know it's it, really cute babies there's a there's a correlation between cute babies and what kind of baby food they eat okay well you know you can't quantify cuteness i mean that's all in the eyes of the beholder so it has to be quantitative the scatter plot when you do the scatter plot it has to show that it's more or less approximately linearly related uh, can't be any outliers. If there's any outliers, if you have data points that are just totally outside of the others, that's called an outlier. What really happens is people just toss those out. They'll just say, well, that, that was a bad measurement. And then uh, X and Y must come from normally distributed populations. So, so this only works in this particular type of a hypothesis test if the X and the Y are both more or less normally uh, distributed. Okay. All right, so here, here's the null hypothesis. Here's the research hypothesis. I, I, I don't know why he's using rho instead of r. Um, for our purposes, it's, just, it's the same idea, okay? So we're going to reject it or not reject it. Here is the t-test. We're going to use the t-test. We've used that many times before. This is the so-called test statistic. This is what we're going to use, okay? Everything is uh, is spelled out there. You know, you, you get the data points, you have N data points, so N ordered pairs. You use the or the data itself to calculate the R. So here's an R, it's 1 minus R squared. Uh, whenever I see something like this, uh, when I see something in the denominator, the first thing that goes through my mind is I say, is there any chance that can be equal to zero? Because if it's zero, it's in the denominator, that means that this thing has a problem, right? Well, one subtract r squared. Well, the r squared takes care of, the squared part takes care of the negative signs. And we're not considering a situation where r is exactly equal to one. If it were exactly equal to one, then we would know for sure that there is a, there is a, it is significant, okay? Wouldn't be any purpose of, there wouldn't be any reason to do this test. So R in this situation cannot be equal to one. If it were one, we'd have a problem. It'd be one take away one is zero. Zero is in the denominator, so it would be an undefined term in there, okay? Okay, the only thing that's a little bit significant here, a little bit interesting, is the degree of freedom is N subtract two. It's because there's two variables. There's an X and there's a Y, and, you know, so that's kind of my intuitive thought about it. So you do have to remember that the degree of freedom is not it's not n subtract 1 like we had before. It's n subtract 2. Okay? All right. So you don't have to identify the claim. The claim is always the same. The claim or the question is always, is there is or is there not a significant linear relationship? The null hypothesis is that there's, there isn't any. H is e, the, uh, that it's 0. And then the research hypothesis is, no, 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 it is. It is uh, it is not equal to zero. Okay, so we, we had an earlier example where they got some information pulled together, and uh, it was example 10 4. Let's take a look at that one. Okay, 10 4 was a car rental. I, I just I kind of skipped over it, but I did mention that it's the number of cars compared to the, to the uh, revenue. So the more cars you have, the more revenue you have. And you do all these calculations, and you finally come up with 0.982. Okay, so that's the correlation coefficient. So it suggests a strong positive relationship. But is it enough? Is it, you know, is it 
does it pass the hypothesis testing test? We're going to see now in just one moment. So this is the example that we're going to be using. This 10-4. Okay, so we're going to test the significance. Uh, alpha is is 0.05. The R that we found up there with those cars is 0.982. Okay, so here's the hypothesis value. It's this is a two test because all we're saying is that rho is not equal to zero. So when we when we do this test, we're going to say, well, it's a two-tailed test. So the 5% error budget, 2.5% is over here, 2.5% is over here. Our, our uh, degree of freedom is n subtract 2. So the, there, are, there were six data points, subtract 2. That gives me four degrees of freedom. So this gives us, from that table, we can now calculate what the critical values are. Okay, so those are the critical values. If you're to the right or to the left of these critical values, you reject the null hypothesis. So now you get the test value. So we already, take my advice, write down the formula every single time. Now you just plug in the numbers and you come up with 10.398. So now you make the decision. Well, we're definitely going to reject the null hypothesis because our test value is way over here. It's way past the critical value. So we reject the null hypothesis. There is a significant relationship between the number of cars a rental agency owns and the annual income. Now, that seems like a silly example, but it just illustrates the point. Okay, so then you got... Okay, so uh, another method we can always use, uh, the second method, which is the so-called p-value. It's exactly the same as what we did before. It's just a matter of uh, you have to find the uh, p-values from the tables. Now, obviously, as I mentioned before, the calculators calculate this for you. So I'm going to let you look at this. It's not something we're going to be testing on. I just want you to be aware of it so that one of these days, if it ever comes up, you'll know what they're talking about. And you, you won't say, gosh, that darn Mr. Cantrell, he didn't even talk about this. The p-value is exactly the same. What you do is you calculate what's the probability of getting that particular test value result or more, more even more extreme than that. What's the probability? Is it 5%? Is it 3%? Is it 70%? Whatever it is, then that helps you decide whether or not you want to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so here's another method is uh, just to use a, a table. This table is, is uh, table 1 in Appendix A. It shows the values of the correlation coefficient that are that are significant. Uh, so it's real simple. You just just look it up. Okay. So for seven degrees of freedom, alpha is 0.05. The uh, table gives a critical value of this. Any value of R greater than that will be significant uh, based on this alpha or based on this alpha, whichever one you're using. So let's take a quick gander at that table. Here it is in the book. Okay. So you have degree of freedoms. This is table I, degree of freedom. You have the two different alphas. If it's bigger than, the, you know, for whatever degree of freedom you're talking about, if it's bigger than that number that's right in here for that particular alpha, then you reject the null hypothesis. So example eight, we want to test the significance. Uh, it's uh, uh, 0.01, R is equal to 0.442, and sample size is 10. So I think we have everything we need. Sample size is 10, so that gives us a degree of freedom of 8. We want a uh, alpha of 0.01, so here we are, 0 0.765. Let's see if that's right. Okay, there it is. So that's the that's the critical value. All right, and uh, I guess that's about it. The, the, uh, the test value we got is 0.442. That's less than the critical value. We do not reject the null hypothesis. So it's very uh, algorithmic. Just... Just plug it, plug it in. Okay. Okay, so this is very interesting, very important. I want you to read it. But there's no reason for me to read it to you. The concept is that you, you never know. Just because there's correlation doesn't mean there's causation. I'll let you read that. This is a concept that's very important, a lurking variable. You never know what else is out there that could be causing uh, changes or could, could be causing certain effects. I, I'm strongly urging you to read this right here. Make sure you read that. It will help you be a critical thinker, and it's very, very important. If you want to be able to be a lot smarter than the guys you see on TV and on the radio, make sure you understand these concepts here. There's no reason for me to read it to you. It's very well written. Okay, so that's the end of section 10-1.